Okay, good morning class. Today I'm recording your finals. I'm going to start with your 180 jury charges. I'll break them up into two to separate videos, okay? So this is your 180 jury charge uh, final exam. Let me give you words that come out. You have people, capitalize it when you can replace prosecution in the sentence, okay? That's it. And I do see courts, capitalize courts when you can replace judge in the sentence. This is going to be final number one, 180 jury charge for five minutes, you all. Hopefully, you've already um, did your speed building prior to this. There is no speed building. Listen to EV360. Okay? 180 number one final. Members and alternate members of the jury. You have been selected and sworn as jurors and alternate jurors for this case. I shall now instruct you as to your basic functions and duties and also your conduct while here in the courtroom. At the conclusion of the case, I will give you further instructions on the law. All of the court's instructions, whether they are given before, during, or after the taking of the testimony are of equal importance. You must base the decisions you make on the facts and on the law. First, you must determine what the facts are from the evidence that is received in the trial and not from any other source. What is a fact? A fact is something that is proved by the evidence or by a stipulation. What is a stipulation? A stipulation is an agreement between the attorneys regarding the facts. Second, you must apply the law that I state to you to the facts as you determine them to be and in this way arrive at a verdict and any finding you are instructed to include in the final verdict. You must accept and follow the facts as I state them to you, whether or not you agree with the law. If anything concerning the law said by the attorneys in their arguments or at any other time during the trial conflicts with my instructions on the law, you must follow the instructions that I have given to you. You must not be influenced by pity for a defendant or prejudice against him. You must not be biased against the defendant because he has been arrested for this offense, charged with the crime or brought to trial in this courtroom. None of these circumstances is evidence of any guilt and you must not infer or assume from any or all of them that he is more likely to be guilty than not guilty. You must not be influenced by mere sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion or prejudice, public opinion or public feeling. Both the people of this state and the defendant have a right to expect that you will conscientiously consider and weigh all of the evidence, apply the law, and reach a just verdict regardless of the consequences. Any statements made by the attorneys during the trial are not evidence. However, if the attorneys stipulate or agree to a fact, you must regard that fact as proven and as to the party or parties making that stipulation. If an objection is sustained to a question, do not guess what the answer might have been. Do not speculate as to the reason for the objection. Do not assume to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked of a witness. A question is not evidence and may be considered only as it helps you to understand the answer. Do not consider for any purpose any offer of evidence that is rejected or any evidence that is stricken by the court. Treat that evidence as though you had never heard it before. You must not independently investigate the facts or the law or consider or discuss facts as to which there is no evidence. This means, for example, that you must not on your own visit the scene of the crime, conduct an experiment, or consult reference works, books, or the internet for additional information. You must not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with the trial except when the following conditions exist. One, the case has been submitted to you for your decision by the court following arguments by counsel and jury instructions. Two, you are discussing the case with a fellow juror. And three, all 12 jurors are present in the jury deliberation room at the same time. You must not read or listen to any accounts or discussions of the case reported by the newspapers or other news media, including radio and television. You will be given notebooks and pencils. Leave them on your seat when you leave each day and each recess. You will be able to take them into the jury room when you deliberate. Please remember to sit in the same seat each day after the trial. One word of caution, you may take notes. However, you should not permit note taking to distract you from the ongoing proceedings here in this courtroom. Remember that you are the judges of the believability of the witnesses. Notes are only an aid to your memory and should not take precedence over your recollection. 
A juror who does not take notes should rely on his or her own recollection of the evidence and not be influenced by the fact that other jurors do take notes. Notes are for the note taker's own personal use and refreshing his or her personal recollection of the evidence that has been presented. Finally, should a discrepancy exist between a juror's recollection of the evidence and a juror's notes or between a juror's recollection and that of another, you may request that the court reporter read back the relevant testimony which must prevail. You will be permitted to separate at the recesses. You must return following the recesses at such times as I instruct you. During recesses, you must not disclose with anyone any subject connected with this trial. As for the alternate jurors, you are bound by all And then we have your number 2180 jury charge. Final. People, sidebar is capital, is um, one word. Clerk of the court, capitalized clerk, capitalized court. This is going to be 180 final for five minutes, number two. And I do see courts capitalize it when you can replace judge, okay? Number 2180 jury charge final. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have not intended by anything that I have said or done or by any questions that I may have asked or by any ruling that I may have made to intimate or suggest to you what you should find the facts to be or that I believe or disbelieve any witness and their testimony. So therefore, if anything I have said or done has seemed to so indicate to you, you will disregard it and form your own conclusions. The purpose of the court's instructions is to provide you with the applicable law so that you may arrive at a just and lawful verdict. Whether some instructions do apply will depend upon what you find to be the facts. Disregard any instruction which applies to the facts determined by you not to exist. Do not conclude that because an instruction has been given, I am expressing an opinion as to the facts. The people and the defendant are entitled to the individual opinion of each juror. Each of you must consider the evidence for the purpose of reaching a just verdict, in this case, if you can do so. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but should do so only after discussing the evidence and the instructions with the other jury members. Do not hesitate to change an opinion if you are convinced it is a wrong opinion. Do not decide any question in a particular way because a majority of the jurors or any one of them favor that particular decision. Do not decide any issue in this case by chance, meaning a mere flip of a coin or some other irrational method. The attitude and the conduct of the jurors at all times are very important. It is very rarely helpful for a juror at the beginning of the deliberations to express an opinion on the case or to announce a determination to stand for a certain final verdict. When one does that, at the outset of the trial, a sense of pride may be aroused in that person and one may hesitate to change a position later or even if that position is shown to be wrong. Remember, you are not partisans or advocates for either side of this matter. You are impartial judges of the facts. In your deliberations, do not discuss or consider the subject of penalty or punishment. That subject must not in any way affect your final verdict. During the deliberation process, any question or request you may have should be addressed to the court on a form that will be provided to you. If there is any disagreement as to the actual testimony, you have the right, if you so choose, to request a readback by the court reporter. You may request a partial or total readback of any section, but any readback should be a fair representation of the evidence. If a readback of testimony is requested, the court reporter will do the following. Delete objections, rulings, and sidebar conferences. This is so that you will hear only the evidence that was actually presented, ladies and gentlemen. Please understand that counsel must first be contacted and it may take time to provide a response or a readback. Continue deliberating until you are called back into the courtroom to hear the readback. The instructions which I'm now giving to you will be made available in written form for your deliberations. They must not be defaced in any way. You will find that the instructions may be typed, printed, or even handwritten. You must disregard any deleted portions of an instruction and not speculate as to what it was at one time or as to what the reason for its deletion. 
You are not to be concerned with the reasons for any modifications. Every part of the text of an instruction, whether typed, printed, or handwritten, is of equal importance. You are to be governed only by the instruction as it appears in its final wording. Do not disclose to anyone outside the jury, not even to me or any member of my staff, either orally or in writing, how you may be decided numerically in your balloting as to any issue unless I specifically instruct you to do so otherwise. You shall now retire and select one of your number to act as four person of the jury. He or she will then preside over your deliberations. In order to reach a verdict, all 12 jurors must agree to the decision and to any finding you have been instructed to include in your verdict. As soon as you have agreed upon a verdict so that when you are polled, each may state truthfully that the verdicts as expressed are his or her own vote. Have them dated and signed by your four person and then return with them to this courtroom. Return any unsigned verdict forms to the clerk of the court. You will be permitted to separate during the noon hour and during evening recesses. During your absence, the courtroom will be kept locked. You are to return following the recesses at 1 p.m. and at 9.30 a.m. on the next succeeding court day. During all of the periods of recess, you must not discuss with anyone any subject connected with Okay, and we'll get ready for your 160s. 160 jury charges. We've got 160 number one jury charge final. Proper names, it says none. Let me see if I see anything real quickly. Court cap it when you can replace judge and state when you can replace prosecution. This is 160 jury charge final. Number one for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you will, please give me your attention. I would ask that you give me your careful and watchful attention for the next 10 minutes or so in order that I may instruct you in regard to the law that is involved in this case. I am doing this in order for you to come to a just and lawful decision. You as members of the jury have to understand the evidence in the case. You also have to understand the law in the case. You must apply that to the evidence as you may find it to be. In every case, terminology is used that may be confusing to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Before I explain the status upon which this indictment is based, let me take a few minutes to explain some of the terms contained within the indictment. Please notice, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that when you receive a copy of the indictment, it charges that the defendant acted lawfully. It charges that the defendant acted willfully when committing these acts. It charges that the defendant acted in a knowing manner let me define some of these terms for you at this time. The word unlawfully means contrary and opposed to the law. To act lawfully means to conduct oneself within the legal boundaries of the law. To act unlawfully means to do something willfully which is contrary to the law. The word willfully as used in the indictment means that an act is done in a purposeful manner. The act is done with the specific intent to do that which the law forbids. The act is completed with a bad purpose in mind. It means to either disobey or completely disregard the law. The indictment before you also charges that the defendant acted in a knowing manner. The purpose of adding that word was to guarantee that no one would be convicted of an act that was done because of a mistake or an innocent misstep. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, a copy of the indictment will be provided to you. The indictment is to be considered by you as evidence in this case. The defendant has pled not guilty to the charges. Therefore, your verdict will be based upon the evidence in the case. In a criminal case, the jury are the exclusive judges of the facts. They are the exclusive judges of the credibility of each of the witnesses. The jury decides what weight should be accorded to the testimony that is given by each of the witnesses. You will want to make sure to try this case upon the evidence that has been presented 
for your consideration. You are the sole judges of the facts in the case. It is your duty to accept the law as it is given to you by the court. You must apply the law to the facts as you find them to be. Take all of the evidence produced in the case by the state and by the defendant. Give it your full, fair, and impartial consideration. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you find there are any conflicts anywhere in the statements of any of the witnesses, try to reconcile them if you can without arriving at any decision that any witness has sworn falsely. The law presumes that every witness is attempting to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Informing your own opinion as to the weight and credibility to be assigned to the testimony of each witness take into consideration a number of things. Look to the general character of the witness. Look at each witness's intelligence and the ability to speak the truth. And in that way, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, determine the weight and credibility you think should be assigned to the testimony of each of the various witnesses. The law presumes that the defendant is innocent of the crime with which he is charged. That means that the state must prove the guilt of the defendant. The defendant is not required to prove his innocence. Every defendant starts in a criminal trial with this presumption of innocence in his favor. That should be kept in mind by you throughout your deliberations in the case. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to entitle the defendant to a verdict of acquittal unless and until the jury is satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt from all of the evidence presented in the case as to the defendant's guilt. A reasonable doubt is just that. A reasonable doubt is a fair doubt. It is a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It arises out of the state of evidence in the case. Okay, and then we have your 160 number two, uh, proper names that are capitalized on the jury charge code book 993.05 and code of tort procedures. Okay, code of tort procedures. This is gonna be uh, 160, number two, final exam, jury charge for five minutes. Gentlemen, I would now like to go over the instruction as it pertains to direct and circumstantial evidence. You may have heard some of this before, but you may hear it differently now that you are a member of the jury and have sat through the trial process. The dictionary defines evidence as a collection of facts that tends to prove or disprove a precept. It is something that has a ground for belief, or it is something that is presented to a court or judicial body or governing, governing body which bears or gives sufficient weight to prove a point in question. In court, gentlemen, let me tell you that the definition of evidence is similar in many respects. But gentlemen, in court, we must apply the principles of law to arrive at that definition. Evidence consists of the testimony of witnesses that is given under oath. Evidence also consists of tangible objects, documents, or anything that is presented to prove or to disprove the existence or non-existence of a fact. Evidence may be either direct or circumstantial. The court will instruct you as follows. Direct evidence is evidence that directly proves a fact without the necessity of an inference and which when considered by itself, if found to be true, establishes that fact. No presumptions are necessary to prove direct evidence. The court will instruct you as follows. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that if found to be true, proves a fact from which the inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. Circumstantial evidence is more susceptible to interpretation than direct evidence. The jury should keep this in mind in their deliberations. The court will further instruct you as follows. It is not necessary that the facts be proved by direct evidence alone. The facts may be proved by a combination of direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. In combination, both direct evidence and circumstantial evidence are acceptable as a means of proof. Neither one is entitled to any greater weight than the other. Members of the jury, you were questioned about your comprehension of that principle and whether or not you agreed with it. 
each of you have arrived at the same decision that you are in agreement with that principle and that you could follow the law if you were instructed on that path. In code book 993.05, there is a further instruction as to circumstantial evidence. It relates to the sufficiency of the circumstantial evidence as to how we prove the case. The court will instruct you as follows. A finding of guilt as to any crime cannot be based on circumstantial evidence alone unless the proved circumstances are not only consistent with the theory that the defendant is guilty of the crime, but that it cannot be reconciled with any other rational or logical conclusion. This requirement is spelled out clearly in the Code of Tort Procedures and is included in the jury instructions. The court will instruct you as follows. Each fact or set of facts which is essential to complete the circumstances necessary to establish the defendant's guilt must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. I have omitted certain parts of the instruction which are not applicable to the case at hand. The court will further instruct you as follows. If the circumstantial evidence as to any particular count or counts is susceptible of two reasonable interpretations, wherein one points to guilt and the other points to innocence, it is the jury's duty to adopt that interpretation that points to innocence and reject the interpretation that points to guilt. Based on all the evidence, there are two reasonable interpretations in this case. The first interpretation may point to the guilt of the defendant. If after a careful evaluation of the testimony and a re-evaluation of the facts, you arrive at the decision that the defendant is guilty, then you have done your job as a member of the jury. The second interpretation may point to the innocence of the defendant. If you have arrived at this decision using the same process that is used to determine guilt, then you have completed your job as a member of the jury. As a member of the jury, you must try to deal with the facts in an objective and dispassionate manner. Evaluate the evidence, keeping in mind that Guilt must be established beyond a reasonable doubt. Members of the jury, you must consider all of the facts, whether reasonable or unreasonable. You must consider all of the facts, whether acceptable or unacceptable. You must draw a conclusion that is both reasonable, acceptable, and rational. We will now take our afternoon recess. Return, please, to the courtroom promptly at 3.45 p.m. Please leave your... Okay, and we'll get ready for the lists. So I'm gonna change files, okay? It'll be in a separate file by itself.